Section 48 of the Expedition of Humphrey Clinker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deborah Lynn. The Expedition of Humphrey Clinker by Tobias Smollett. Section 48. To Dr. Lewis. Dear Doctor, Considering the tax we pay for turnpikes, the roads of this county constitute a most intolerable grievance. Between Newark and Weatherby I have suffered more from jolting and swinging than ever I felt in the whole course of my life, although the carriage is remarkably commodious and well hung, and the postillions were very careful in driving. I am now safely housed at the new inn at Harrogate, whither I came to satisfy my curiosity, rather than with any view of advantage to my health, and truly, after having considered all the parts and particulars of the place, I cannot account for the concourse of people one finds here, upon any other principle but that of caprice, which seems to be the character of our nation. Harrogate is a wild common, bare and bleak, without tree or shrub or the least signs of cultivation, and the people who come to drink the water are crowded together in paltry inns, where the few tolerable rooms are monopolized by the friends and favourites of the house, and all the rest of the lodgers are obliged to put up with dirty holes, where there is neither space, air, nor convenience. My apartment is about ten feet square, and when the folding bed is down there is just room sufficient to pass between it and the fire. One might expect, indeed, that there would be no occasion for a fire at midsummer, but here the climate is so backward that an ash-tree which our landlord has planted before my window is just beginning to put forth its leaves, and I am fain to have my bed warmed every night. As for the water, which is said to have effected so many surprising cures, I have drank it once, and the first draught has cured me of all desire to repeat the medicine. Some people say it smells of rotten eggs, and others compare it to the scourings of a foul gun. It is generally supposed to be strongly impregnated with sulphur, and Dr. Shaw, in his book upon mineral water, says he has seen flakes of sulphur floating in the well, paste tantiviri. I, for my part, have never observed anything like sulphur, either in or about the well, neither do I find that any brimstone has ever been extracted from the water. As for the smell, if I may be allowed to judge from my own organs, it is exactly that of bilge water, and the saline taste of it seems to declare that it is nothing else than salt water putrefied in the bowels of the earth. I was obliged to hold my nose with one hand while I advanced the glass to my mouth with the other, and after I had made shift to swallow it, my stomach could hardly retain what it had received. The only effects it produced were sickness, griping, and insurmountable disgust. I can hardly mention it without puking. The world is strangely misled by the affectation of singularity. I cannot help suspecting that this water owes its reputation, in a great measure, to its being so strikingly offensive. On the same kind of analogy, a German doctor has introduced hemlock and other poisons as specifics into the Materia Medica. I am persuaded that all the cures ascribed to the Harrogate water would have been as efficaciously and infinitely more agreeably performed by the internal and external use of sea-water. Sure I am, this last is much less nauseous to the taste and smell, and much more gentle in its operation as a purge, as well as more extensive in its medical qualities." Two days ago we went across the country to visit Squire Burdock, who married a first cousin of my father, an heiress who brought him an estate of a thousand a year. This gentleman is a declared opponent of the ministry and parliament, and having an opulent fortune, piques himself upon living in the country and maintaining old English hospitality. By the by, this is a phrase very much used by the English themselves, both in words and writing, but I never heard of it out of the island." except by way of irony and sarcasm. What the hospitality of our forefathers has been, I should be glad to see recorded, rather in the memoirs of strangers who have visited our country, and were the proper objects and judges of such hospitality, than in the discourse and lucubrations of the modern English, who seem to describe it from theory and conjecture. Certain it is, we are generally looked upon by foreigners as a people totally destitute of this virtue, and I never was in any country abroad where I did not meet with persons of distinction who complained of having been inhospitably used in Great Britain. A gentleman of France, Italy, or Germany, who has entertained and lodged an Englishman at his house, 
when he afterwards meets with his guest at london is asked to dinner at the saracen's head the turk's head the boar's head or the bear eats raw beef and butter drinks execrable port and is allowed to pay his share of the reckoning but to return from this digression which my feeling for the honour of my country obliged me to make our yorkshire cousin has been a mighty fox-hunter before the lord but now he is too fat and unwieldy to leap ditches in five bar gates nevertheless he still keeps a pack of hounds which are well exercised and his huntsman every night entertains him with the adventures of the day's chase which he recites in a tone and terms that are extremely curious and significant in the meantime his broad brawn is scratched by one of his grooms this fellow it seems having no inclination to curry any beast out of the stable was at great pains to scallop his nails in such a manner that the blood followed at every stroke he was in hopes that he would be dismissed from this disagreeable office but the event turned out contrary to his expectation his master declared he was the best scratcher in the family and now he will not suffer any other servant to draw a nail upon his carcass the squire's lady is very proud without being stiff or inaccessible she receives even her inferiors in point of fortune with a kind of arrogant civility but then she thinks she has a right to treat them with the most ungracious freedoms of speech and never fails to let them know she is sensible of her own superior affluence in a word she speaks well of no living soul and has not one single friend in the world her husband hates her mortally but although the brute is sometimes so very powerful in him that he will have his own way he generally truckles to her dominion and dreads like a schoolboy the lash of her tongue on the other hand she is afraid of provoking him too far lest he should make some desperate effort to shake off her yoke she therefore acquiesces in the proofs he daily gives of his attachment to the liberty of an english freeholder by saying and doing at his own table whatever gratifies the brutality of his disposition or contributes to the ease of his person the house though large is neither elegant nor comfortable it looks like a great inn crowded with travellers who dine at the landlord's ordinary where there is a great profusion of victuals and drink but mine host seems to be misplaced and i would rather dine upon filberts with a hermit than feed upon venison with a hog the footmen might be aptly compared to the waiters of a tavern if they were more serviceable and less rapacious but they are generally insolent and inattentive and so greedy that I think I can dine better and for less expense at the Star and Garter in Pall Mall than at our cousin's castle in Yorkshire. The squire is not only accommodated with a wife, but he is also blessed with an only son, about two and twenty, just returned from Italy, a complete fiddler and dilettante, and he slips no opportunity of manifesting the most perfect contempt for his own father. When we arrived there was a family of foreigners at the house on a visit to this virtuoso, with whom they had been acquainted at the spa it was the count de melville with his lady on their way to scotland mr burdock had met with an accident in consequence of which both the count and i would have retired but the young gentleman and his mother insisted upon our staying dinner and their serenity seemed to be so little ruffled by what had happened that we complied with their invitation the squire had been brought home overnight in his post-chaise so terribly belaboured about the pate that he seemed to be in a state of stupefaction and had ever since remained speechless a country apothecary called grieve who lived in a neighbouring village having been called to his assistance had let him blood and applied a poultice to his head declaring that he had no fever nor any other bad symptom but the loss of speech if he really had lost that faculty but the young squire said this practitioner was an ignorantatio that there was a fracture in the cranium, and that there was a necessity for having him trepanned without loss of time. His mother, espousing this opinion, had sent an express to York for a surgeon to perform the operation, and he was already come with his prentice and instruments. Having examined the patient's head, he began to prepare his dressings, though Grieve still retained his first opinion that there was no fracture, and was the more confirmed in it as the squire had passed the night in profound sleep uninterrupted by any catching or convulsion the york surgeon said he could not tell whether there was a fracture until he should take off the scalp but at any rate the operation might be of service in giving vent to any blood that might be extravasated either above or below the dura mater the lady and her son were clear for trying the experiment and grieve was dismissed with some marks of contempt which perhaps he owed to the plainness of his appearance he seemed to be about the middle age wore his own black hair without any sort of dressing, 
By his garb one would have taken him for a Quaker, but he had none of the stiffness of that sect. On the contrary, he was very submissive, respectful, and remarkably taciturn. Leaving the ladies in an apartment by themselves, we adjourned to the patient's chamber, where the dressings and instruments were displayed in order upon a pewter dish. The operator, laying aside his coat and periwig, equipped himself with a nightcap, apron, and sleeves, while his prentice and footman, seizing the squire's head, began to place it in a proper posture. But mark what followed. The patient, bolting upright in the bed, collared each of these assistants with the grasp of Hercules, exclaiming in a bellowing tone, "'I han't lived so long in Yorkshire to be trepanned by such vermin as you,' and leaping on the floor, put on his breeches quietly, to the astonishment of us all. The surgeon still insisted upon the operation, alleging it was now plain that the brain was injured, and desiring the servants put him into bed again. But nobody would venture to execute his orders, or even to interpose, when the squire turned him and his assistants out of doors, and threw his apparatus out at the window. Having thus asserted his prerogative, and put on his clothes with the help of a valet, the Count, with my nephew and me, were introduced by his son, and received with his usual style of rustic civility. Then, turning to Signor Macaroni, with a sarcastic grin, "'I tell thee what, Dick,' said he, "'a man's skull is not to be bored every time his head is broken, and I'll convince thee and thy mother that I know as many tricks as e'er an old fox in the West Riding.' We afterwards understood he had quarrelled at a public-house with an exciseman, whom he challenged to about at single stick, in which he had been worsted, and that the shame of this defeat had tied up his tongue. As for madam, she had shown no concern for his disaster, and now heard of his recovery without emotion. She had taken some little notice of my sister and niece, though rather with a view to indulge her own petulance than out of any sentiment of regard to our family. She said Liddy was a fright, and ordered her woman to adjust her head before dinner. But she would not meddle with Tabby, whose spirit, she soon perceived, was not to be irritated with impunity. At table she acknowledged me so far as to say she had heard of my father, though she hinted that he had disobliged her family by making a poor match in Wales. She was disagreeably familiar in her inquiries about our circumstances, and asked if I intended to bring up my nephew to the law. I told her that, as he had an independent fortune, he should follow no profession but that of a country gentleman and that I was not without hopes of procuring for him a seat in Parliament. "'Pray, cousin,' said she, "'what may his fortune be?' When I answered that, with what I should be able to give him, he would have better than two thousand a year, she replied, with a disdainful toss of her head, that it would be impossible for him to preserve his independence on such a paltry provision. Not a little nettled at this arrogant remark, I told her I had the honour to sit in Parliament with her father, when he had little more than half that income, and I believed there was not a more independent and incorruptible member in the house. "'Eh, but times are changed,' cried the squire. "'Country gentlemen nowadays live after another fashion. My table alone stands me in a cool thousand a quarter, though I raise my own stock, import my own liquors, and have everything at the first hand. True it is, I keep open house and receive all comers for the honour of old England.' "'If that be the case,' said I, "'tis a wonder you can maintain it at so small an expense. "'But every private gentleman is not expected to keep a caravanserai "'for the accommodation of travellers. "'Indeed, if every individual lived in the same style, "'you would not have such a number of guests at your table. "'Of consequence, your hospitality would not shine so bright "'for the glory of the West Riding.' "'The young squire, tickled by this ironical observation, exclaimed, "'O che burla!' His mother eyed me in silence with a supercilious air, and the father of the feast, taking a bumper of October. "'My service to you, cousin Bramble,' said he. "'I have always heard there was something keen and biting in the air of the Welch Mountains.' I was much pleased with the Count de Melville, who was sensible, easy, and polite, and the Countess is the most amiable woman I ever beheld. In the afternoon they took leave of their entertainers, and the young gentleman, mounting his horse, undertook to conduct their coach through the park, while one of their servants rode round to give notice to the rest, whom they had left at a public-house on the road. The moment their backs were turned, the censorious demon took possession of our Yorkshire landlady and our sister Tabitha. The former observed that the countess was a good sort of a body, but totally ignorant of good breeding, consequently awkward in her address. The squire said he did not pretend to the breeding of anything but colts, but that the jade would be very handsome if she was a little more in flesh. "'Handsome!' cried Tabby. 
she has indeed a pair of black eyes without any meaning. But then there is not a good feature in her face. I know not what you call good features in Wales, replied our landlord, but they'll pass in Yorkshire. Then, turning to Liddy, he added, What say you, my pretty red streak? What is your opinion of the countess? I think, cried Liddy with great emotion, she's an angel. Tabby chid her for talking with such freedom in company, and the lady of the house said, in a contemptuous tone, she supposed Miss had been brought up at some country boarding school. Our conversation was suddenly interrupted by the young gentleman, who galloped into the yard, all aghast, exclaiming that the coach was attacked by a great number of highwaymen. My nephew and I rushed out, found his own and his servant's horse ready saddled in the stable, with pistols in the caps. We mounted instantly, ordering Clinker and Dutton to follow with all possible expedition. But notwithstanding all the speed we could make, the action was over before we arrived, and the Count with his lady safe lodged at the house of Grieve, who had signalized himself in a very remarkable manner on this occasion. At the turning of a lane that led to the village where the Count's servants remained, a couple of robbers a horseback suddenly appeared with their pistols advanced. One kept the coachman in awe, and the other demanded the Count's money, while the young squire went off at full speed without ever casting a look behind. The Count, desiring the thief to withdraw his pistol, as the lady was in great terror, delivered his purse without making the least resistance. But not satisfied with this booty, which was pretty considerable, the rascal insisted upon rifling her of her earrings and necklace, and the Countess screamed with affright. Her husband, exasperated at the violence with which she was threatened, wrested the pistol out of the fellow's hand, and turning it upon him, snapped it in his face. But the robber, knowing there was no charge in it, drew another from his bosom, and in all probability would have killed him on the spot, had not his life been saved by a wonderful interposition. Grieve the apothecary, chancing to pass that very instant, ran up to the coach, and with a crab-stick, which was all the weapon he had, brought the fellow to the ground with the first blow. Then, seizing his pistol, presented it at his colleague, who fired his piece at random, and fled without further opposition. The other was secured by the assistance of the Count and the coachman, and his legs being tied under the belly of his own horse, Grieve conducted him to the village, whither also the carriage proceeded. It was with great difficulty the Countess could be kept from swooning, but at last she was happily conveyed to the house of the apothecary, who went into the shop to prepare some drops for her, while his wife and daughter administered to her in another apartment. I found the Count standing in the kitchen with the parson of the parish, and expressing much impatience to see his protector, whom as yet he had scarce found time to thank for the essential service he had done him and the Countess. The daughter passing at the same time with a glass of water, Monsieur de Melville could not help taking notice of her figure, which was strikingly engaging. A, eh, said the parson, she is the prettiest girl and the best girl in all my parish, and if I could give my son an estate of ten thousand a year, he should have my consent to lay it at her feet. If Mr. Grieve had been as solicitous about getting money as he has been in performing all the duties of a primitive Christian, he would not have hung so long upon his hands. What is her name? said I. Sixteen years ago, answered the vicar, I christened her by the names of Seraphina Melvilia. Ha! What? How? cried the Count eagerly. Sure, you said Seraphina Melvilia. I did, said he. Mr. Grieve told me those were the names of two noble persons abroad, to whom he had been obliged for more than life. The Count, without speaking another syllable, rushed into the parlour, crying, This is your goddaughter, my dear. Mrs. Grieve, then seizing the Countess by the hand, exclaimed with great agitation, Oh, madam, oh, sir, I am... I am your poor Eleanor. This is my Seraphina Melvilia, O oh child. These are the Count and Countess of Melville, the generous, the glorious benefactors of thy once unhappy parents. The Countess, rising from her seat, threw her arms about the neck of the amiable Seraphina, and clasped her to her breast with great tenderness, while she herself was embraced by the weeping mother. This moving scene was completed by the entrance of Grieve himself, who, falling on his knees before the Count, Behold, said he, a penitent, who at length can look upon his patron without shrinking. Ah, Ferdinand, cried he, raising and folding him in his arms, the playfellow of my infancy, the companion of my youth. Is it to you, then, I am indebted for my life? 
"'Heaven has heard my prayer,' said the other, "'and given me an opportunity to prove myself not altogether unworthy of your clemency and protection.' He then kissed the hand of the countess, while Monsieur de Melville saluted his wife and lovely daughter, and all of us were greatly affected by this pathetic recognition. In a word, Grieve was no other than Ferdinand Count Fathom, whose adventures were printed many years ago. Being a sincere convert to virtue, he had changed his name, that he might elude the enquiries of the Count, whose generous allowance he determined to forego, that he might have no dependence but upon his own industry and moderation. He had accordingly settled in this village as a practitioner in surgery and physic, and for some years wrestled with all the miseries of indigence, which, however, he and his wife had borne with the most exemplary resignation. At length, by dint of unwearied attention to the duties of his profession, which he exercised with equal humanity and success, he had acquired tolerable share of business among the farmers and common people, which enabled him to live in a decent manner. He had been scarce ever seen to smile, was unaffectedly pious, and all the time he could spare from the avocations of his employment he spent in educating his daughter and in studying for his own improvement. In short, the adventurer Fathom was, under the name of Grieve, universally respected among the commonality of this district, as a prodigy of learning and virtue. These particulars I learned from the vicar when we quitted the room, that they might be under no restraint in their mutual effusions. I make no doubt that Grieve will be pressed to leave off business and reunite himself to the Count's family, and as the Countess seemed extremely fond of his daughter, she will in all probability insist upon Seraphina's accompanying her to Scotland. Having paid our compliments to these noble persons, we returned to the Squire's, where we expected an invitation to pass the night, which was wet and raw. But it seems Squire Burdick's hospitality reached not so far for the honour of Yorkshire. We therefore departed in the evening, and lay at an inn, where I caught cold. In hope of riding it down, before it could take fast hold on my constitution, I resolved to visit another relation, one Mr. Pimpernel, who lived about a dozen miles from the place where we lodged. Pimpernel, being the youngest of four sons, was bred an attorney at Furnival's Inn, but all his elder brothers dying, he got himself called to the bar for the honour of his family, and soon after this preferment succeeded to his father's estate, which was very considerable. He carried home with him all the knavish chicanery of the lowest pettifogger, together with a wife whom he had purchased of a drayman for twenty pounds, and he soon found means to obtain a dedimus as an acting justice of peace. He is not only a sordid miser in his disposition, but his avarice is mingled with a spirit of despotism which is truly diabolical. He is a brutal husband, an unnatural parent, a harsh master, an oppressive landlord, a litigious neighbour, and a partial magistrate. Friends he has none, and in point of hospitality and good breeding, our cousin Burdock is a prince in comparison of this ungracious miscreant, whose house is the lively representation of a jail. Our reception was suitable to the character I have sketched. Had it depended upon the wife, we should have been kindly treated. She is really a good sort of a woman, in spite of her low original, and well respected in the country. But she has not interest enough in her own house to command a draught of table-beer, far less to bestow any kind of education on her children, who run about like tagged colts in a state of nature. Pox on him! He is such a dirty fellow that I have not patience to prosecute the subject. By that time we reached Harrogate, I began to be visited by certain rheumatic symptoms. The Scotch lawyer, Mr. Micklewomen, recommended a hot bath of these waters so earnestly that I was over-persuaded to try the experiment. He had used it often with success, and always stayed an hour in the bath, which was a tub filled with Harrogate water heated for the purpose. If I could hardly bear the smell of a single tumbler when cold, you may guess how my nose was regaled by the streams arising from a hot bath of the same fluid. At night I was conducted into a dark hole on the ground floor, where the tub smoked and stunk like the pot of Asheron in one corner, and in another stood a dirty bed provided with thick blankets, in which I was to sweat after coming out of the bath. My heart seemed to die within me when I entered this dismal bagnio, and found my brain assaulted by such insufferable effluvia. I cursed mickle women for not considering that my organs were formed on this side of the tweed, but being ashamed to recoil upon the threshold I submitted to the process. After having endured all but real suffocation for above a quarter of an hour in the tub, 
I was moved to the bed and wrapped in blankets. There I lay a full hour, panting with intolerable heat, but not the least moisture appearing on my skin, I was carried to my own chamber and passed the night without closing an eye, in such a flutter of spirits as rendered me the most miserable wretch in being. I should certainly have run distracted if the rarefaction of my blood, occasioned by that Stygian bath, had not burst the vessels and produced a violent hemorrhage, which, though dreadful and alarming, removed the horrible disquiet. I lost two pounds of blood and more on this occasion, and find myself still weak and languid, but I believe a little exercise will forward my recovery, and therefore I am resolved to set out to-morrow for York, in my way to Scarborough, where I propose to brace up my fibres by sea-bathing, which I know is one of your favourite specifics. There is, however, one disease for which you have found as yet no specific, and that is old age, of which this tedious, unconnected epistle is an infallible symptom." What, therefore, cannot be cured must be endured by you as well as by yours, Matt Bramble, Harrogate, June 26th. End of section 48